Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here. Welcome to a very, very different kind of review because today I'm gonna to be taking a look at a brand new 3D printer. I want to start by saying a huge thank you to Mingda of 3dmingda.com, links in the description, for actually supplying today's product for me. Now, usually when I review something, I make a point of having paid for it by myself because I think that makes it clearer to you guys that I haven't been incentivized to be positive. But today I have decided to accept because I really could use a second 3D printer. And if it doesn't suit my needs, then it's going to be obvious to you guys. I couldn't hide it even if I wanted to because it would show through in the 3D prints. So I have, it's a huge box, you wouldn't believe this thing, oh, pretty big box here, and inside is the Mingda Magician X, which is a brand new 3D printer, and from their website it costs $279, which is 200 Great British Pounds. That is quite a lot cheaper than the Flashforge Adventurer 3 3D printer that I've been using so far, which cost me £350. So I'll be very, very interested to see how the prints from this compare. So there are lots of features on this printer. Many of them seem quite interesting, and if they work, many of them will be quite impressive. But we'll talk about those a little bit more once the printer is out and set up. So let's get this thing out and find out what it's like. Should be fun. Okay, so let's break out everybody's tetanus friend, Rusty, and take a look. So from their website, I've been able to gather that ease of use is something they've really gone for with this printer. So the assembly appears to be absolutely minimal, although we'll find out more about that in just a second. And also the leveling is supposed to be very intuitive and easy. Uh, and leveling obviously can be quite a head scratcher, can't it, with 3D printers, and heaven knows I've discovered that with mine. So. Yeah, if this printer, as I think it's going to, will completely take care of leveling by itself, then that will be a huge advantage to this printer. Okay, let's take a look inside. Right, so this piece is labeled top, so let's break in and see what's inside. Oh, wow. Okay, so it looks like quite a large piece of equipment, actually, and the print bed for this is quite large. I believe the print area is 230 by 230 millimeters, and it's 260 millimeters high. So that's pretty huge. That's much, much larger than on my Adventurer 3. So value for money is looking pretty good so far. Okay, so I have a Magician X 3D printer user manual here. So I will have to obviously read this before I set this thing up. But let's take a look. So you've got the parts identified here. So we've got the gantry, the main chassis, and a filament holder. That's what this gray thing is in the top then. There's various parts in the toolkit, including the nozzle, an SD card, which is pretty cool. Do we get a free SD card with this? Uh, and some wrenches and power cables and a little bit of Teflon tube. I'm not sure what that will be for yet. Okay, so this is where the small amount of assembly comes into play. It looks as though the gantry just screws down onto the chassis base, which looks good and easy. And then you also install the filament holder on the side you prefer, so it can go on the left or right, I believe. We'll try that later on. I'm not sure which side I'll choose yet. Cable connecting, so obviously that connects the gantry to the main chassis, I assume. That looks fairly easy, just a, a ribbon cable by the looks of it. And then leveling, this is the part I'm interested in for leveling. So you've got to plug it in, click menu, then click ABL. The system will automatically level after heating. Wow. That's it, that's all you do for leveling. So if that works, that is gonna be such a problem solved. Then preheating, so I'm guessing, is this just so that you can preheat the nozzle and the bed, just for testing purposes? Uh, no, no, this is so you can insert the filament. Okay, so you preheat it first, then you load the filament. Okay, that's fine. And then printing, so you just select a G-code to print, presumably off the SD card, although I think a web printing is enabled with this. And then you've got software installation and use. So this does use Cura, that's the slicing software. So basically that takes the object that you've designed, whatever it is, and it converts it into a file that can be recognized and then printed by the printer itself. Uh, this will be for later on, but uh, I will try this obviously with one of my own models or something. Presumably there are no automatic profiles on Cura yet for this particular printer. Presumably they will come eventually, but this just shows you the settings you need to put into the slicing software so that all of the settings match and work. But that's fine, I can, I can do this. Uh, there are quite a lot of settings to put in by the looks of things. <laughs> but that's okay. So it seems remarkably simple, 
doesn't it? <laughs> really, just a few short pages and it seems to have covered every base. So let's take a look what we've got. First thing, we've got a little bit of filament inside here. I believe this will be PLA. I suppose I might as well try this to begin with. But the nozzle temperature can go up to, I believe, 250 degrees. So for everything PLA, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so we've got various tools inside here. Here's the Teflon tube. We've got ooh, some quality tools inside here. We've got some Allen keys. We call them Allen keys. A little spanner inside there. Various screws. There is the nozzle. This is a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, and as you can see, it is removable. So to replace this thing should be pretty easy. We do have an SD card inside here. Ooh, it's not got any labeling on it, but you know, I've got loads of those anyway. And then this looks like a panel. I believe this printer, get this, even has built into it a little toolbox, literally, so that you can store all of the tools on the printer so that you can't lose them. I mean, some thought has gone into the design of this thing, hasn't it? Then we've got this piece here, which is the filament holder. I have got some larger spools. I've got some one kilogram spools. So if it can hold one of those without any problems, then you know it's gonna be suitable for most people, isn't it? Then we've got the power cable, which does have the British plug on it. That's a good sign. And then I guess we'll start taking out the actual printer itself. Now, is this piece separate? Yeah, well, I'll get that out in a second then. And we'll show you what's in the bottom. So right here, we have the main chassis and the print bread, which is absolutely ginormous. Yeah, so that's approaching 30 centimeters on the print bed there. Yeah, that's really, really large. Okay, so I'm gonna get all this stuff out. I will put it together and I will uh, feed back to you on how easy it is. And then obviously we will give this thing a try. So the base piece, or the main chassis, does appear to be made of plastic, but it is that sort of durable, good quality kind, and it does feel nice and solid as you handle the thing. The top half, or the gantry, if you will, is actually made of metal though, and that again is quite a heavy part. So fixing the gantry to the chassis is reasonably easy, you've just got two screws to go in the base, and you can tighten those up with the Allen keys provided, and then you've just got a couple more screws on each side just to very securely mount the thing. Then you can put your spool holder on. Like I say, that goes on the left or right. I've put mine on the right, but it's a very easy fit and it's an easy thing to change over if you want to. Then it's just a case of plugging in the cables. There are quite a few different cables to plug in, but it's all fairly easy to do. And on this side, there's even a little clip that the wires fit around so that they're not getting tugged as the machine works. This machine is direct drive, which means all of the mechanism, the motors, the gears, everything for propelling the filament is all contained within the extruder assembly. And interestingly, the nozzle is pre-fitted, meaning the one I pulled out of the box is actually a spare. Now that's really cool, what a nice inclusion. So I think the thing is set up and ready to go. And the first step, according to the instructions, is to switch the machine on and get it leveled. So I'm gonna do that right now. Hopefully it won't blow up. I'll grab the instructions. Okay, so it's loaded into the menu. Actually, in standby, this thing is pretty quiet. There is a fan running inside, but it's not a noisy one. Right, so it does say on the instructions that the actual user interface may be a little bit different to the one pictured. And yeah, it does seem to be. Mm, hang on. Ah, that's a problem. <laughs> okay, well, that's a little bit awkward, but I should be able to get to the screen. I'll have to get the rest of that out later on. Right, let's go back. Oh gosh, this is actually a good touch screen. I'm used to really having to prod these things to get it to work. But yeah, it does actually work pretty nicely. So I think we're gonna want leveling. Wow, is that it? So I've noticed that it is preheating by itself, which is good because obviously materials do expand and contract depending on their temperature. And you want the leveling to be correct at the printing temperature. So yeah, that's smart, makes sense. Let's watch it go. Okay, it's reached temperature. It's taken the bed quite a while to reach temperature. I think that's just because it's so huge. All right, well, let's see. So this should be completely automated without me having to intervene at all. It's pretty cool. 
Wow. It feels like I'm watching magic here, folks. This is pretty amazing. All that faffing about, I'll have to show you the, uh, the calibration process for the Adventurer 3. It takes a long time. And of course, you've got to do it manually. You've got to mess around with bits of paper and, and adjust it up or down 0.1 millimeter at a time. It takes forever. And this appears to be doing far more than nine points of calibration as well. I haven't been counting, but yeah. Because it's such a big plate, I'm assuming it needs more points of calibration. But yeah, this is great. There. Bilinear leveling done, it says. Impressive. That did not take too long. So it's looking good. Next, I'm going to load in this small roll of PLA that the printer came with. So I believe, first of all, I need to preheat. So let me find the setting for that. Preheat. So according to this, it does do ABS. I didn't think it said ABS on their website, but yeah, if you want to print ABS at 230 degrees, you can. Cool. It's probably deeply unnecessary to mount this on the spool holder, but I'm going to do it because it'll be out of the way, won't it? Don't want to get this raveled up, though. <laughs> I'll just hold it like a pillock for a few minutes. So this is a bit strange. It says one, after preheating, press the load button, and then step two, insert SD card. What? Are you sure? Right, so I figured it out. You have to pop the filament in and then you keep pushing load. So when you push load once, it will just push the filament through a small way. And you have to keep doing it until your colour comes through. <laughs> so as you can see, the white that I've put in is now starting to come out. It's still a bit pinkish. So we'll leave it until it's come right through. And now I think I can try the test print. So it appears to be up and running. <laughs> Hopefully I've got the filament installed correctly. And I don't know what it's creating. It looks like some sort of gear of some description. So I'll keep an eye on this. And when it's finished its first ever print, I'll show it to you and see how it turned out. Well, obviously I couldn't have been more wrong about this first print being a gear. That ain't no gear. I have no idea what it is, but apparently it's going to be a big print. It's only done about 10% of it so far. So whatever is going to be born is still a mystery to me. This is crazy. I thought it would just be a tiny little object that takes 10 minutes. This is probably going to take a good hour. <laughs> okay, well, I'll see you later then, much later than expected. So while this was printing, I decided to go downstairs and set up my Cura software so that I could print my own stuff. And apparently the profile for this printer, for the Cura software, was on the SD card. And I pulled it out and it actually did cancel the print. So it doesn't store the print in memory while it's doing it. So I'm left with that. So rather than start this thing again and produce whatever it was, although I might do that one day, I might as well just try a print on my SD card. This is one of my chassis and uh, we'll see whether or not it comes out all right. Might as well keep using the white filament that was provided. Let's have a look. It's gonna be a white chassis, that should be interesting. Might well run out of filament before it gets finished, but it should give us some idea of what uh, the print quality is gonna be like. So it seems to me as though it's printing that first layer a bit too low, because <laughs> all I'm getting is a white smear on the build plate, which isn't exactly great. Now, if I find that the hot end is printing too close or too far away from the print bed, I don't have to go ahead and recalibrate it. I don't have to fold pieces of paper in half and you know try and get the right distance. I can literally just jump into menu, Z offset, and then I can change this value up and down. I can change the value to within a hundredth of a millimeter, as you can see, which is absolutely insane. Uh, I don't do that incidentally. I leave it at a tenth of a millimeter and then I can nudge it up and down as I see fit, and it doesn't have to go through the whole rigmarole of re-leveling every time, so that is absolutely fantastic. Alternatively, you've got this baby step option, which allows you to nudge up and down the Z value during a print, and it actually updates live as it's printing, so if you print something with a large base layer, you can nudge that Z value up and down until it is printing that base layer correctly, and then you can just hit save and that updates the main Z value in the system. So then you're only having to do one waste print rather than loads of them trying to get it calibrated. So that's pretty darn handy, it's a very cool feature. 
So obviously I don't want the nozzle digging into the print bed like that, so I've decided to get quite radical and unload the stock filament that came with the printer and load in some of my Esun black filament, just because there's plenty of it there and I know it will finish the print with that amount. And I'm going to start the print again with the new Z offset. Uh, it might just take a few little practice prints to get that first layer level just right. But after that, we should be laughing. So I think it's about ready to print. Let's see if this first layer is any better. Don't want to destroy a brand new build plate. I've also put a skirt on this version of the model. Okay, so the first print has completed. Let's pop this off the build plate, if possible. Seems to be pretty well stuck down, actually. I wasn't expecting that. There we go, I got it. And there it is up close, and actually, that has done a fantastic job. I mean, here is the same chassis produced by my previous 3D printer, the Flashforge Adventure 3. To say the Mingda costs, you know, only two thirds of what the Flashforge does, I think it's done a pretty good job on this. And it did take a few goes. The first few times it wasn't sticking to the plate properly and then it warped a little bit, but that's just part and parcel of 3D printing. I went into the Cura software, I changed some of the settings, I altered the cooling fan, I changed the temperature of the bed, and it didn't take very long at all to get a decent print. But I wasn't very efficient. I had it print far too many outer shells of this model, which made it take around, well, over two hours to print. And I know for a fact that these chassis can print in, you know, an hour or so. So I've mimicked the Flashforge Adventurer settings, more or less, for the Mingda printer. And I'm told that the next chassis will take less than 40 minutes to print. And to see that, I will have to believe it. So let's give this a go. Okay, I think it's ready to start. Here we go. So this one should be way, way faster. And it should be a better comparison as well between this and the Adventurer, because like I say, I've matched the settings. Okay, that is finished, and it was true to its word, 40 minutes and the thing is finished. So let's pull this off, and that is the second successful consecutive print. And actually, the quality of this is very, very, very close to the standard produced by my £150 more expensive 3D printer, which is pretty impressive actually, yeah, that is really quite acceptable. Yeah, this machine really is fantastic for the money. Right, well, I'm running out of time for this video, but I'm going to change the filament one more time. I'm gonna pop my gray filament on and just try a wagon body to go onto the chassis that I've just created because I think it would be rude not to. So similar sort of settings. Let's clean the print bed off and let's give this a try. And for this one, I'm using pretty modest print speeds, actually slower than the profile recommended from Mingda and I'm using the same layer height as on my Flashforge Adventure 3, and the ETA is literally 30 minutes, which somehow is way faster than the Flashforge. So again, we'll have to see how the quality compares. Okay, so there you have it. That is the body for the chassis that I've just printed on the Magician X. And to be honest, this is really not too bad at all. The quality of the print is not at all far away from the Flashforge Adventurer 3 that I've got. And when you consider that the Magician X costs around 150 pounds less than that thing, I think this is actually really quite acceptable. There's a tiny little bit of warping on the edges, as you can see. Um, I've seen much, much worse, and I do think I'll be able to reduce that if I change some of the print settings and such. But yeah, there's really nothing too bad about that. And as you can see, it's reproduced the planking on the inside really quite nicely. And I did not use particularly high settings for this. This was printed literally in 33 minutes. <laughs> which actually is a lot faster than the Flashforge does it under the same sort of settings. So actually, if I did adjust the settings so that this took an hour, which is more like what the Flashforge takes, I suppose the quality might be the same or maybe even better. So yes, more experimentation is needed, but it's looking very, very good, particularly for what this unit cost. 
Speaking of changing the print settings, I was able to improve the print quality tenfold by drastically reducing the print speed and also enabling the acceleration and jerk control, which bizarrely were not enabled on the profile that Mingda supplied, although I do expect Mingda will optimise their profile for the final release because I've fed back to them and they you know, thanked me for my feedback and such, so hopefully that won't be a problem. But having messed around with the settings for about a week now, the printer is producing much, much better prints to the point where I'd say now it's slightly better than the Flash Forge Adventurer 3. Here's a tanker. It's produced all of the tiny details, particularly on the top, really, really precisely. I've been able to do proper underframes with it and everything. Yeah, really, under the right settings, like any printer, really, it is producing fantastic results. So let's take a look at some of the pros and cons for this printer. Huge pro, first of all, auto leveling, fantastic. Fantastic function, saves absolutely loads of time. Large print area, amazing. You can produce really large models with this. It's got a heated bed, which should help to reduce warping, and I guess it does do. The build quality of the actual unit is pretty good. There is some plastic construction on there, but overall it is pretty sturdy, and the parts that need to be metal are, which is good. The print quality, I can now say, is a huge pro on this. For 200 quid, this is printing exceptionally well, in my opinion. And of course, that brings us on to the final pro, which is the price. Very, very reasonable for such high performance. A couple of cons then, most of these are fairly minor, but if I'm showing pros, I might as well show some cons. So first of all, no enclosure around the printer, which obviously makes temperature regulation a bit more difficult. And if you're in a place that's well ventilated with lots of air movements, you, you could sometimes see warping, I suppose, because of that. Which leads us on to the second con. Yes, you do sometimes see builds curling up at the edges and warping slightly. However, that is only with the naked build plate. I applied a small amount of prick stick glue, you know, just glue stick glue onto the build plate, and I've never seen it warp since, so that's a very easy fix. Next minor con, some assembly is required. It's no big deal, it takes five minutes, but if you're allergic to screws or something, then maybe this isn't for you, but honestly, it's not a deal breaker. And the final con is the slight inconsistency in the Z height at the start of each print. So it tends to randomly move up or down a tenth of a millimetre occasionally between prints. Not all the time, but occasionally. Um, this is obviously not too critical because you have that baby step function, which means you can correct it. But it does mean that you've got to print stuff with a skirt and you've got to keep a close eye on the first layer and just adjust the Z height so that it's going to print in an optimal way. Not a big deal, though. So overall, I'm very, very impressed with this printer. It's now performing very, very well, or like I say, slightly better than the Flash Forge Adventurer 3. And given the fact that it cost 150 quid less than that, going by the current price on Mingus website, that is pretty darn impressive. So yeah, stay tuned to the channel if you want to see more of how this printer performs. I will certainly be showing more builds produced by this printer in the future. But for now, thank you to Mingda for sending me this printer. I will definitely make good use of it. And thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Any feedback for me on 3D printing stuff would be much appreciated. But for now, I'll say thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one. All right, cheers everybody. Take care.